jeepers you're listening to smash or pass hello everyone welcome back to another podcast on the jb and millie channel i am jb and joining me as always is millie hi and we have rihanna hello and our special guest today is mr tom ruger hey hi guys Thank you so much for joining us today. It's an absolute honor to get to speak with you, and we're excited to talk about you know your whole career today. But I guess starting back from your education, we understand from our research that you went to Dartmouth College, and they do say that quite often you can pick up some things that impact you in the long run. You know, join education. So, is there anything that you learned in your time at Dartmouth College that you would say had some type of impact on your on your later career? Oh, most definitely. My uh, my number one college professor was a fellow named Maurice Rapp, who uh, grew up uh, literally on the lot at MGM. His father, Harry Rapp, was a uh, big producer for uh, MGM. And uh, so Maury and his friends, uh, they would just run around the lot. They like knew Greta Garbo by name. It was just wild. So he was a little kid back then, and he he ultimately uh, became a screenwriter. He wrote uh, he wrote, he wrote "Song of the South" with some other people. He wrote uh, "So Dear to My Heart" for Disney. He he, he worked for Disney for quite a while. So uh, he was a major influence. He was my number one professor, and uh, I made my first two cartoons under his tutelage uh so yeah he was great wow that's amazing and so can i ask while you were at dartmouth was there any you know shows or movies that you particularly enjoyed that you think you know started to inspire you towards getting into the industry certainly uh i I mean i saw citizen kane for the first time when i was at dartmouth and i you know i was uh, amazed by that I thought that was just the most profound use of filmmaking. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we ran uh, something called uh, the Dartmouth Film Society, which was the first film society uh, college based in the US. It started in the 40s. And so uh, after I graduated from Dartmouth, I, I ran the film society for a year. and. We booked every kind of film that was being made at that point, and also uh, every movie that was of significance uh, from the past, we would run those. And I remember distinctly uh, one time, um, and I would try to book a lot of animation because I loved animation. I got I wrote to Chuck Jones to see if he would, because uh, back then a lot of the cartoons weren't that accessible. And I was looking for, uh, uh, duck a muck, and I, I asked him where I could find it, and he said, "Well, you can have, you can borrow my print." So, uh, anyway, it was interesting how to gather these things together. But one night we were showing um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and it's a, you know, it's like seventy minutes, so you want to fill out the program. So I, I booked a bunch of cartoons, and I opened it which was just weird. This is 1977. And uh, I opened it with the theme song in color, you know, beautiful print of uh, the theme song to the, the, Mickey, the Mickey Mouse Club. And, you know, who's the leader of the club that's meant for you and the MIC? So, uh, so we played that. And I, you know, I just thought it would be fun. And so we had 900, this theater holds 900, it was packed, 900 college kids. So, and, it, and that, that theme song begins. Oh, who's the lead? So the minute that that fanfare came on, the entire 900 kids just they started screaming. It was, it was like the Beatles were there. And then the song began and they, 900 voices singing along with a theme song. And I mean, it sent chills down my spine. I said, yeah, th- this animation thing is, is worth pursuing. This is a good thing. Um, uh, that was like a cultural moment that I, I just uh, amazed me. Oh, wow. That's amazing. And, 
you know, we're so glad that you definitely did pursue it. And as you said, like, as soon as you started with, like, seeing the Mickey Mouse theme, like, I, 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 I'm going to speak for myself, but I was, like, about to start singing along with it. It's stuck in my head now. It's that catchy. But you um, went on to work for Hanna-Barbera, and we know that after doing some research that you initially spoke to Mr. Hanna, who eventually called you back for a meeting. So how did you prepare for this initial meeting, and what, how were you feeling during it? Because I can, like, I can assume that you were very nervous, possibly. Well, do you want me to tell you how that happened, that meeting? Mm. Yes, please. Unless, unless you already know, which is... Uh, Anyway, um, I drove out to California. I was in New Jersey after my stint as the Dartmouth College uh, Film Society coordinator. I was back at home in New Jersey and I was doing roofing uh, for my brother. And I was trying to get a job in advertising in New York, which the animation business is very small in New York, but in California, it's big. But I thought, oh, advertising is close and I, I couldn't get arrested. So, uh, and I was falling off the roofs, uh, the roofs, because uh, I was daydream. I'd be carrying shingles up a ladder, you know, they're, they're heavy. And uh, I'd get to the top of the roof and I, I'd, I'd be thinking of different little cartoon ideas and I'd take a step and I'd, I actually uh, went through a, this, this guy's damaged roof and I, I crashed through Ooh. into, uh, onto his patio where he had a, a glass table full of potted plants. Oh, wow. and so oh. I, I destroyed all the plants and the table. And, uh, you know, it, it cost more than my day's salary, I'll tell you that. So, oh, uh, so that night I decided uh, I, I got to get out of here. So I drove to California and Ralph Bakshi at that time was making his Lord of the Rings. And I thought, oh, they, they need bodies there because they were just tracing stuff. They were tracing live action. I said, I can, I can trace that, I can do that. So I got out here and I went to his studio first and they said, uh, well, he's not here today. So you'll have to leave your portfolio. And uh, I had a you know, big cumbersome portfolio. And so I left it there and then, and then I realized, well, that, that, that really, I didn't realize that really ties you up because then you can't go and pitch yourself elsewhere. So I did, and I thought, I'll go get it if I need it. So I started calling up every studio in town and I was staying at the Sunset Motel on Sunset Boulevard, which was a dingy dump of a place and uh, no phones in the room. I mean, I had a TV, but it was really, really, uh, it was cheap. And out front, there was a phone booth that was uh, used by, uh, uh, you know, the, the women of the night. They, 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 but they used it during the day. And so there were always three or four girls hanging out at that phone booth and they'd get called. So I went out there, I said, can I use the phone? I got to make some calls and because there's no phone in the room. So, I have a bunch of dimes and quarters and they say, yeah, but make it snappy. You know, we got calls coming in. So uh, I called around and one of the calls I made was to Hanna-Barbera and they said, well, who would you, uh, with whom would you like to speak? And I, I, I really, this is how naive I was. I, I didn't really have any plan. It was just like, I was just gonna cold call everyone. So I said, oh, uh, uh, Bill Hanna. And so they, uh, they put me through and his, Secretary, you know, Bill Hanna's office, may I help you? And I said, oh, I'm Tom Ruger. I, I'm just, I'm an animator. I just came in from the East Coast and I'm looking for work. And, uh, and that was not completely true because I, I had made some animation in college, but you know, I don't know if I was a professional animator. So he, she took, uh, she said, well, let me have your number. He, he's not here now. And if he wants to call you, he'll call you. So I gave him the, the, the number on the phone, the phone booth they had. Now, later on, they didn't have numbers that you could call back on the phone booth. In fact, that was a working number where you could call in and out. So I gave him the number, I gave her the number and uh, I went back to my little hut, my little room and I was gonna go through the Hollywood Reporter to find other animation studios. 
And I told uh, the young women that were standing there, hey, you know, if a call comes in for Tom Ruger, I'm in, I'm in room seven, would you go get me? And they were like looking at me like, I'm out of my mind now. Yeah, I don't know. They're probably not gonna come get me. Um, so that's a problem. So I go back to my room and I'm, I'm going through the Hollywood Reporter and I get a knock on the door and hello, yeah. Are you Ruger? Yeah. Oh, there's a phone, there's a call for you at the phone, but hurry it up. I got an important call coming in. And uh, so I went out there and it was uh, Ginger, uh, Bill Hanna's secretary says, yes, please hold for Mr. Hanna. And, uh, and he goes, hello. He says, hi, uh, Mr. Hanna, this is Tom River. Get over here real quick, we're, we're really busy. Get over here, come see me right away. And he hung up the phone, that was it. It was like, <laughs> Talk about a cold call. So I was like, wait, where am I going? I, I didn't even have the address. I had to go back to the Hollywood Reporter. Where are they? And I got lost on the way because uh, Kwanga Boulevard uh, goes up through uh, Hollywood, but then it, it like goes under the freeway and, and it goes over into Burbank and it's, a, it's just bizarre. Uh, Kwanga Boulevard is all over the place. So. Uh, but this is near uh, Universal Studios. So I finally get there and they, they bring me into Bill Hanna and he's got, all, he's got a bunch of guys doing work. Oh yeah, Ruger, come here, come here. Well, let me see your portfolio. And, I, and I, I, all I had, I had the whole thing, but it was on slides. It's all, my whole portfolio. Because I had left my portfolio at Factions and uh, so he's holding the slides up to the window of the light. What, the, what is that? So that's a dog. You know, it's a dr cartoon drawing of a dog. That's not a dog where I come from. <laughs> uh, so I says, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you a, a one month trial period. Uh, if, you, if you cut it, you can stay. Uh, if you don't, you know, we'll let you go. So you get a month. And, uh, and it was uh, 500 bucks a week. It was a union job, it was 500 bucks a week. And, let me tell you, in 1978, that was like, it was like, are you kidding me? I'm a millionaire. That's incredible. 500. So uh, I started, I, uh, I, I worked literally around the clock. I would take my work home. I would take it uh, on the weekends. I, but, uh, and I, I, a friend of mine and I got an apartment. And so anyway, I, I survived that test. Um, Wow, that is just such an <laughs> incredible so. like story. When you hear about people striving to to break through the ceiling in order to get into an industry, and in your case, perhaps that tale is a bit more literal in that sense. But I, it's just like it's just amazing how things happened in in that succession. And I guess expanding upon that trial period that you had, I guess either psychologically. Or in terms of you know, in terms of your work, did any was there any additional pressure working on shows that had a pre-established fandom versus a new original show that was coming through? Well, well, if we're talking about back then, um, uh, one of the the first thing I drew was uh, Godzilla and Janna of the Jungle. So I did uh, in betweens and cleanup and and uh, assistant animation on those. And uh, not answering your question, but the Godzilla show had really thick lines, really thick lines, almost like magic marker thick lines. And the Xerox machine, would, uh, you know, by then we were Xeroxing on the cells, the, the lines. Uh, the line was so thick that in between uh, the out, outlines of the black, the, it, the inner part of the black, it was so wide, it, it, it would go gray and it, it, the line wouldn't hold together. We had to paint the back of the cell where, where that was happening. It was a mess. It was a lot of work. Um, uh, so the only, I think, uh, culturally uh, significant cartoons I worked on at that point at Hanna-Barbera, I worked on the new Fred and Barney show, the Flintstones, uh, you know, follow up. And uh, I worked on Scooby and uh, the Scooby process was, uh, we had a lot of stock footage, uh, stock animation, not footage, but we had this library, just files and files of Scooby scenes. 
and you were supposed to go in there and grab as many scenes as you could to do your animation work rather than sit there and redraw everything. And uh, so they'd have them jump into the Shaggy's arms. That's, it always would work the same. Um, uh, and then uh, the Flintstones was the first thing I actually animated on. The new Fred and Barney show was called. And the first scene I painted was Fred painted. The first scene I animated was Fred painting the side of a house. And the, the head guys, uh, Bill Kyle and uh, Bob Go and Jay Sarbri uh, were really, you know, gifted uh, long-term animators and they, they would teach you. There's a, there's a thing that happens, it's, it's an overlap. So, it's, so if the brush is, if you're painting upward and the brush is going like this, and then at this point, it really, go, it really, it pops as you're brushing and it pop. And uh, so these are things I learned. I learned from Bullis Jones how to animate uh, bees, a swarm of bees. And this again is in the paper and pencil era. You put sandpaper, really uh, rough sandpaper under the paper and you take the side of your pencil and you rub it and it, and it creates like uh, you know, little tiny marks on the side of the page. Anyway, uh, cultural, oh, the, but the question, one more time. I guess just was there any additional pressure working on shows that people knew had a fan base following it versus shows that they were almost testing the water with? Right. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, I think I, I did a lot of work on Scooby. So, but that would be uh, more in the writing development area. Um, you know, when you're an animator in this town and uh, assistant animator, you're really kind of one of the last people to get hold of the work. You know, it's gone through a lot of processes. There's producers, writers, and network people they've already like passed their judgment on things and by the time you're an animator you're, by the time it gets to you you're like just you just got to do what's there um i think uh fan bases uh started getting important uh when i was working on the scooby stuff because people did care about that oh yeah like we are all like really really like great fans of scooby we have been ever since you know we were children and it's just been a show that's always stuck with us and you personally have had a hand in developing and writing some of our favorite shows and episodes like one that stands out to me is no sharking zone which i believe was part of the new scooby and scrappy show and I know from my doing research that, you know, while writing, you referred back to the original 1969 show, but considering obviously that the new Scooby and Scrappy-Doo show included Scrappy, who was an original character for that series, how did you approach finding out his role in the game? Well, uh, that was quite literally the very first Scooby script I wrote, No Shark Moves In. And uh, I had never... I had never seen a Scooby episode in my life until uh, they said, oh, we write, write one of these. So I took it all home and I researched it and, and I wrote No Sharking Zone, really kind of kind of winging it and uh, handed it in. And my uh, pal there, Hank Sarine, was the story editor on Scooby. And he said, oh, this is great. And he went to Margaret Lash, who was in charge of the writers, and he said, this guy should be the story editor on Scooby. And uh, so she came to me and she said, you want to do that? And I said, oh, you know, sure. <laughs> you know, you want to keep it, stay employed. Uh, so that's when I, in earnest, said, well, I, I have to now, like, instantly become a Scooby ex expert. So I took home these huge three quarter inch tapes and the machine that weekend and I took home 50 Scooby tapes from uh, 69 through, what was that? It was like 70, uh, it was uh, eight, yeah, yeah it was, where was it? When was that? 80, 82, yeah, it was 82. So there are a lot of Scoobies because I had gone to Filmation to write before that. Um, now that show uh, did have Scrappy in it and so I researched the heck out of Scooby and, and Daphne and, and, and Shaggy 
and I, I put a book together with all their routines and all the kind of bits they do and uh, you know standard catchphrases and so and I have that and I could go get it but it'll it'll cumbersome um, and uh, the the Scooby episodes that I, I story edited I, I just started handing them out to the writers that were on staff there at, at Hanna Barbera and. Sometimes they would come to me with a premise, but I had to generate a lot of the premises. Uh, now people, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a group of, I don't know where they're from, but <laughs> they're from everywhere, but there's some people that dislike Scrappy. And for me, Scrappy was not a problem because when I started on the show, Scrappy was already involved. I mean, I didn't, create Scrappy, I didn't bring him in. He was there. It was uh, Shaggy, Scooby, Scrappy, and Daphne when, when I started. That was the, the foursome. And so it, I, it just worked for me. And, and Scrappy was helpful in that he didn't want Daphne to just have no one to talk to because uh, Shaggy and Scoob were a pair. Daphne was uh, at that point sort of on her own, she had she didn't have Fred or Belma. She needed someone, so Scrappy was good. I think the first season of Scrappy he had a terrible voice by Lenny Weinrib, God bless him, and uh, it just was really obnoxious. Sort of Muggs, uh, Bowery Boys, uh, nah, I'm dead, you know, just kind of really <laughs> annoying. And then they brought in uh, Don Messick. I think they saved a couple of bucks by having him double up for Scooby and Scrappy. Scooby, uh, Don Messick was so brilliant. He, he had a trick larynx. And if Scooby and Scrappy were jumping off a cliff or falling off a cliff and go, ah, he could, uh, he did not have to record it twice. As they're falling, you could hear both Scooby and Scrappy from his one, oh, oh. And, oh, and, wow. But, but, at the same time. So I think he had like a double larynx. It was amazing. Um, uh, so anyway, so yeah, I, I really became kind of the dog guy at Hanna-Barbera. Uh, when Scooby wasn't being done, um, I was doing pound puppies. I also did a, a show called Yogi's Treasure Hunt, which had all the classic characters that I grew up with, uh, you know, Yogi, Huck, uh, Quick Draw. And we liked that a lot. And that's where we got to meet Dawes Butler. And he would come in and give us tips. Uh, John Luden and I story edited that. And he would uh, stop by, give us tips. Uh, uh, Paul Winchell who, Winchell, who played dastardly, would, would come by and pitch new show ideas. <laughs> Wow, that sounds incredible. And it's so good to hear more about kind of how you got into writing Scooby. And can I ask, like you say, there was, you know, the four main characters that you were initially working with, you know, isn't the first four people perhaps that people would think of when they think of Scooby D. So can I ask, did you ever find a character that you enjoyed writing for the most? On um, Scooby Show? Yeah, through any of the work that you did with Scooby, did, was there a particular character that stands out to you as one that you enjoyed writing for more than the others slightly, or that you could perhaps relate to any more that, you know, made them more, you know, enjoyable to write for? Well, I think Scooby and Shaggy were, were the most fun because they were, they were really all comedy. They were all fright takes and food. Uh, so uh, I could relate. I mean, you know, they were constantly looking for a meal and, uh, you know, and they were always encouraging everyone to leave the scary area now. Um, and you realize that they had the munchies. <laughs> but that must be what was going on there. They had the munchies all the time. Um, uh, when uh, I made Pup Named Scooby-Doo, oh, you know, we did the 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, uh, Mitch Shower's Baby. And I, I, I helped, I developed that with Mitch and uh, that was a, a really fun experience. Uh, 13 Ghosts, we should talk about that in a minute. But uh, on a pup named Scooby, uh, I really liked writing for Daphne because she was, uh, she could scream really well. And uh, she had sort of the whole, she was sort of vain. Uh, she didn't want to get her go-go boots dirty. It was a period piece. 
Um, I also love that, uh, and I don't know why anyone hadn't done this yet, but on 13 Goes of Scooby-Doo, I had the idea of, of putting uh, a chorus of voices, a cappella voices behind the show as the score, like Scooby-Doo-Doo-Doo-Doo, Scooby-Doo-Doo-Doo, because the names, the Scooby-Doo show came from that Frank Sinatra song where he said, Scooby-Doo-Doo-Doo, it came from that uh, years before. And I thought, well, that's sort of scatting. We should scat the, the, the background music. And I thought it worked beautifully on a pup. Mm. And uh, of course, again, it was a period piece. So I, I think uh, 13 Ghosts and Pup, they were sort of half hour stories and I, I think, uh, I did like the half hour stories. I thought the 11s were tough to uh, really address all the, the characters. Uh, occasionally we'd bring back Freddie and Velma in like a half hour adventure, like uh, a Nutcracker Scoob, uh, throw them in. And uh, I think Scooby's birthday, where there's a bad mistake in that one, where I think you call Freddie by the wrong last name. <laughs> and no one caught it. No one caught it. Yeah. I feel like we're all going to be going back to watch that episode now and just kind of see what's that. That's yeah, amazing. Freddie Rogers, right? Uh, it's it's Shag, Shaggy Rogers and Freddie Jones, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we flipped it. See, I'm doing it now. Uh, we called him uh, Freddie Rogers. And it's, and, and, and it's like on a stage. And now Freddie Rogers. And, uh, uh, you know, you think Freddie <laughs> would correct it. No, sir. Uh, that's not my name. No, I mean it certainly is. It, that sounds so fun. Like I genuinely want to go back and watch that episode just to kind of see that. I, I don't know how we didn't notice that before. That's incredible. Like that we did the didn't birthday see that. episode. Yeah, it's the birthday episode. Oh, yeah. Um. So, uh, but writing writing on Scooby was uh, it was great. Once I had all the um, sort of the the shtick memorized, it really became a sort of second nature. It was a great experience. So I, I worked on Scooby from uh, 82 to uh, 89. Oh, that's incredible. And so can I ask in regards to the episodes as you were writing them, did you kind of write them in the order that they were gonna be aired or was it that you had, you know, if you were writing a full series that you had different ideas and then kind of put them in order afterwards? Well, uh, that would be the way to do it, wouldn't it? Uh, and that's how I did Animaniacs, where we, we were able to make a whole bunch of cartoons. And then I, I made a checkerboard out of it. I took this one and put it with that one. And it was, it was a good way to almost make e each half hour have almost a theme. But the Scooby shows, we were under always under a deadline. And it's a shame, but there's always this uh, production schedule. They don't. For some reason, they don't do a lot of stuff in advance. So it's like by the time they've, uh, the net by the time the network has said yes, we want season two of Scooby, it's like March or April, and so that means uh, May and June you have to write the scripts frantically, and then July, August uh, you got to be boarding them, and then September you're going on the air. So the very first one that went through is just coming back, uh, just barely getting done, like the week before it's gonna, going to air. So uh, the scheduling uh, is not ideal. Um, we, were, we were almost always putting episodes on, on the air that had bad painting errors. Sometimes they get fixed in the rerun, but not always, yeah. And uh, if you notice, um, I was watching this the other day. Uh, Scrappy, it's like it's like the animators didn't have like a size comparison model sheet <laughs> because there would be scenes where Scrappy would be, uh, you know, well, I think he's probably like at least that tall. I mean, he, he's he's got to be uh, three feet tall, I think. You know, in real life, up to Shaggy's uh, like thigh at least but sometimes they have them uh like as big as your foot i mean he looks <laughs> tiny 
and it's like he'll be leaning over Daphne's shoulder where his head is bigger than Daphne's. And then the next scene, his 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 whole body is, is up to her, like just her knee or something. Anyway, I don't know why that didn't get fixed. Oh gosh. Like I, I remember every time I watch it and I always point it out, be like, Scrappy's changed size. I don't know what's going, maybe he's going through a weird growth situation where he's like, and it, it's kind of funny because there's also a scene in uh, the 2002 Scooby-Doo movie where it, when Scrappy's turning into like Scrappy Rex, like going back to normal Scrappy, where his head's so much bigger than his body and that always makes me laugh. So I wonder if they used that little bit where like Scrappy's head's bigger in the cartoon in that in some yeah. way with inspiration. His, yeah, his head is almost as big as Scooby's head sometimes, you know? And, but then the little diminutive body. Um, but I, I really think the first season, uh, I think really hurt Scrappy with the, the Lenny Weinrib voice. I think it was murder. Um, so, so I didn't have that problem and, you know, he sounded fine. Uh, we did, the 11 minutes were tough though, because, you know, you're, you're taking a mask off someone in 11 minutes and it doesn't really create a, a, a perfect mystery situation. It's just too fast to turn the ideas around, you know? Yeah, that's very true. And I guess moving on to like, touching on your time as an associate producer and story editor on the 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, there's, a thing that confuses everyone. Some people like it, some people hate it, where Shaggy's shirt is changed from green to red. So we're wondering, do you recall where the idea of that came from? Yes, I do. Uh, Mitch Shower, who's a brilliant artist. Um, and I, I should show you some art from him. Should I go get it? Oh, yes, please. That would mm, yes, be absolutely please. amazing. So yeah, um, Mitch Shower, if you'll notice on uh, 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, uh, Daphne and well, you you notice Daphne and uh, Shaggy are slightly redesigned. Yeah. Uh, there's a, the line work is a little different. It's a little they're a real genuine artist, Mitch Shower, uh, and he was the producer and the the inspiration behind the show. He he sort of uh, championed the whole idea. So it started. Thirteen Ghosts of Scooby Doo started with. Uh, Oh yeah. Yes. Oh wow. Am I holding it correctly? Yeah, that's coming. Oh, I don't know that, correct. but it was good. Um, let's see. Oh, oh is that the wolf no. Yeah. Why don't I just send these to you uh, as Xeroxes, or I send you copies, and you can cut them in. Yeah, yeah that'd was. be great. That's definitely more than possible. If you can send them over, please, I'll be able to. Have I've got a Vincent, Vincent Price. He was a big fan of Vincent Price. Ooh, uh, oh, wow. Uh, cool. uh, you can use the sound. I'll, I'll send you the jar. So he had, uh, and he was a huge fan of the Universal Monsters. And he basically, he wanted to do Scooby-Doo versus the Universal Monsters. And uh, Hanna-Barbera didn't want to spend any money on that. Like, he, they didn't want to make a deal. Uh, so he said, well, let's just make, and I've got a bunch, I'll send you a bunch. Uh, I've got all sorts of different things in there. I've got the Bibles to different shows, uh, you know, how Scrappy was sort of the narrator on some episodes. Anyway, I'll send you some drawings. Thank You'll you. have to send me your emails, okay? Yeah, um, yeah thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, yeah, so, so Mitch Shower was, the, the uh, the body and soul of uh, the Thirteen Ghosts of Scooby Doo. It was his concept that uh, we do these classic monsters, and that it not be people taking masks off, but it be real ghosts and goblins and scary people, scary characters. And uh, that was the first because up till then, Scooby's villains were all creepy guys that wanted the oil under the land. Uh, at the at the house, um, so uh, ABC uh, Jenny Triez, uh, who was in charge of children's uh, Squire Rushnell, uh, they they approved it, and so that was that one year, Thirteen Ghosts of Scooby Doo, and um, so Mitch, you know, he changed their attire 
their attire and he just said, you know, I'm going to go red with <laughs> this shaggy <laughs> shirt and I don't care who's, who's upset by it. And I thought it was good for that for that episode. He had a red t-shirt because he's worn that green one. I mean, that's got to be a stinky t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, and it, it worked. Um, I think the first episode we have, uh, do we have all the ghouls you've loved um, before? Is that the second yes. one or the first one? I think yeah. the first one is to all the ghouls I've loved before. before. Yeah. 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 Um, and that's a beautiful episode, the crash landing of the plane. Yeah. Now that of course introduces the character of Flim Flam, mm -hmm. which is a, uh, of all the, the Scooby shows. And I love <laughs> Sue Blue. She's a great voice actor, but of all the characters in the Scooby series, that that's the that's the problem character for me. Uh, <laughs> oh wow! He's just uh, uh, I mean he's unnecessary, and he he was a <laughs> network uh, request. They wanted a mm. kid. They wanted a kid to, you know, be the the entry point for the the kids watching. I said they're watching Scooby. The, that's the entry point. There's a funny dog that they like and they've liked them for years. Oh no, we need a kid. And so then we, <laughs> then the problem is we introduced a kid who was behaved much older than Shaggy. I mean, <laughs> it's not like he was a little kid. He was a obnoxious uh, older kid sort of. Um, anyway, that gave, uh, Scrappy, another person to talk to. And so Daphne was again <laughs> out, left in the lurch. She had no one to talk to again. Um, so we had, uh, so Daphne was in those shows uh, where no Velma, no Fred, uh, she had to do a lot of the uh, sort of explanations of what's going on. And, you know, she'd stay on the mystery. She'd stay on the, She'd be very focused. So I was glad to let her become a child again uh, with uh, a pup. Oh, definitely. And, you know, the 13 Ghosts Scooby-Doo, a pup named Scooby-Doo, all of them, they, they all hold a special place in everyone's heart. And I think that in 13 Ghosts, it really allowed Daphne as a character to grow and expand further than just danger prone Daphne. And I guess speaking more on characters, you mentioned how Mitch really liked Vincent Price. And, you know, obviously Vincent Van Gogh was based on Vincent Price in a lot of ways. So were you ever involved in the casting process for 13 Ghosts show? And was Vincent Price pitched to be Vincent Van Gogh's voice? Yes. Uh we, I don't think Vincent Van Gogh even uh, was in the show until we we had a guarantee that Vincent Price would do it. Um, we wrote it for him. We, uh, you know, if we ha didn't get him, we probably would have changed the character's name and, and gotten tried to get someone else. We wanted a, a celebrity in that role. We thought it was a, a pretty good uh, showy piece. Um, even though I, it's kind of dragged in out of left field, <laughs> but there he is. Um, uh, and uh, he, he did the, uh, all 13 episodes in four different recordings. That, so we only had them for four different times. Mm -hmm. So we would do basically three episodes per, per recording. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense because, you know, there wasn't a tremendous amount of material uh, that he had to record. And uh, he was, He's, now, is he an, is he American? Is he was he born in the U.S. Because he he comes off well. He's very elegant and and you know sophisticated, incredibly sophisticated, and he almost sounds British, but I don't know if he is. Um, and uh, very precise and uh, and you know he almost never had to do two takes. I mean, we just r read it, and it was just like incredibly perfect. It's, I mean, it, it sounded just like Vincent Price. It was Vincent Price. And he knew when to pour on the, the, uh, the villainy almost. And, uh, but mainly he kept it pretty light. He liked it too. I did a, uh, the, 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 year, the season that, that the Vincent Price, uh, Everything Ghost of Scooby-Doo uh, premiered, uh, ABC had 
uh, the, each season, when, the night before premiere on, on Saturday, on Friday night before they would do these um, preview shows, like a half hour preview show. And uh, so the Scooby one was, the new Scooby show was on the next day. So it was a part of this preview show and they, ABC had me write the preview show. And, uh, and so the stars of the preview show were uh, Tony Danza, uh, R2-D2 and C-3PO. And, Cause they had the, the Star Wars cartoons coming on the next day. And, uh, and <laughs> a gymnast that had just won uh, uh, Mary Lou Retton, yeah. Mary Lou Retton, she just won Olympic gold and she was gonna be doing the fun fitness things on Saturday morning where she'd teach kids how to, you know, don't forget to exercise and she'd flip around. And so I wrote this script and uh, the director said, oh no, that's, that's like way too long. Cut half of it, cut this, cut that. And I said, I, 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 I don't think it's long. I was very good at writing lengthy scripts. I wrote 50 page scripts for a half hour Scooby and people say, oh, that's way too long. And no, because I put in all this description, it isn't too long. And so anyway, same thing with this script. So uh, they're filming the thing, Tony Danz is there and Mary Lou Retton uh, doesn't have a work permit. So they can't use her until someone goes and gets a work permit because she's under 18. And uh, so they can't shoot anything with her. And uh, uh, C-3PO and R2-D2, uh, the, the robots are, you know, they're break, bump, bumping into wall. Tony Danz is just doing what he can do. And so at so three o'clock in the afternoon, they, they've shot the entire script and they're ready to stop. They're ready to call it. And uh, the director suddenly says, no, no one can leave, no one can leave, no. <laughs> and it turns out the show was, uh, it's a half hour show. And he, he, he timed out what he filmed and it was 15 minutes. He only had 15 minutes of a show. So I was right. <laughs> the script wasn't too long. And so they had me go uh, find the original script and Xerox it and bring it to them. And they started shooting the rest of the script. Um, but Tony Danza, this is on a Friday. He wanted to leave. He was at three o'clock, he wanted to leave and he had, an absolute mental breakdown. He was, I wish I had had a video camera. He, he, he went into a, a tirade that uh, was classic. It was, it had every bad word in the book in front of poor little Mary who read, he was just screaming, ah, you, I'm leaving. They had to actually pay him more money to stay and finish it. Um, so that, yeah, but uh, I'm off Scooby, sorry. Oh no, it's no problem at all. I mean, just the hearing these anecdotes from you, like such a legend in the industry, it's just amazing to hear all these stories from you. And like the world of animation and Scooby is definitely like so much better off with you being involved <laughs> with it. Like, definitely, I can say that for certainty. But I guess the other hey, side one, of the, of one of the funniest guys I ever met, and he passed away, his name was George Atkins. And he wrote some of the, uh, the short Scoobies like South Pole Vault. Uh, he, he wrote uh, a bunch of those. Look for his name, George Atkins. I guarantee you in every George Atkins script, there'll be something in there that will make you chuckle uh, out loud. Um, George Atkins was just in real life, just like the funniest man. He would tell the funniest stories I've ever heard. And he wrote just, to give you an idea of who this guy was, he personally wrote, completely wrote every fractured fairy tale from uh, from the, the Rocky and Bullwinkle shows. He wrote every one of them, which are brilliant satire. Um, yeah, so he did he did some of our shows. Oh, that's incredible! Just so, so that so many people were involved in this and. I don't know. I, I think that the response from, you know, fans and the community probably has become a lot more prominent now with, you know, the age of social media and you know, Twitter, TikTok and all that. But yeah, I think I know... the conventions too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, the they make a big difference. Yeah. Mm. 
But say a show like The 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, that changed so much from what people had come to expect from the series. Was Did you, at the time of working on that show, did any of, like, the fan praise or backlash ever get to the people behind the scenes in terms of, you know, would it affect anything? Or did you know going into it that some people would be divided on it? You know what? Uh, and maybe, maybe I'm wrong, uh, but uh, if you research this, I, I just feel that there was very little uh, interaction between the producers and the viewers. I mean, occasionally they do a focus group on a show, you know, they show it to kids, but in, and this is, uh, we're talking about 80, what, 85, 86? Yeah, 86. Um, very, very little um, interaction. We get letters occasionally, you know, uh, we got a letter about the 13 ghosts, what a letter, we got a lot of letters. Uh, there were um, some religious groups that were very upset that up to that point, Scooby's, the villains had always been people wearing masks, but now we had real, uh, you know, ghosts, specters, uh, you know, and they, they thought that was very, uh, you know, not, not the Christian way to go. So that, that was, uh, we got a lot of uh, negative, negative input. I think that hurt, uh, that probably hurt our renewal. Yeah, I mean, it is a shame that whenever something tries to take a different approach with it, you know, there's always going to be a group of people that aren't on board with it. But I guess, you know, another show that you're involved with that, you know, changed the mold for Scooby. It kind of took a whole new approach at it. it is a pup named Scooby-Doo, which I absolutely loved watching, you know, as a kid. I binge watched it very recently. It's just always such a good show. And like you mentioned, all the musical cues, like there's always some joy to find in the series, be it the opening credits, the writing, the characters, and the kind of do ba do ba do but conceptually like I, I guess with you being the creator how involved were you with you know the title of the show and I guess the overall premise well yeah it's I thought uh, that show uh, and not disparaging any of the other incarnations but that show really uh, went together beautifully it's like a beautiful tapestry of Scooby-esque material um, yeah, I think the music really works the uh, um, I mean, the voices are great. The voices really were perfect for each character. Uh, originally, um, the show, uh, they wanted a Scooby. There has been a year gap. There hadn't been a Scooby. And uh, ABC basically said, what can we do? We need to do something new. And uh, I had been doodling some young Scoobies and I, and I proposed, you know, about, I think it was originally called Scooby-Doo, the early years. And, uh, um, you know, they bought it. Uh, we had a lot of great artists uh, helping to redesign the characters, um, you know, the backgrounds with Shaggy's house with the Christmas lights on all year round. Um, I remember uh, Iwo Takamoto, uh, who, was, who drew the original Scoobies, uh, he designed them. Um, we had finished, uh, Scott Geralds and some of the other guys, we had uh, worked on these new designs for young Scooby, Shaggy, Freddy, uh, Velma, Daphne, and, uh, and we set it in the 60s. So uh, it, was, it was a period piece. And so we're done, we're ready, you know, we're, we're, start, we're boarding, we're, we're making the show. And uh, Ewo calls us down, uh, you know, me, Scott, Alfred Gimeno, and Ewo's uh, son, and uh, who worked there. And he brought us into his room, his, you know, and he's like the chief designer of all the shows at Hanna-Barbera. And so he sat down at his drawing table and he had us lined up behind him. He said, here, come, come here, let me show you something. And he, puts down our drawings of you know, Shaggy, Scooby, all of them. And he's at the light table and he puts a piece of paper over them. And he says, so here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking like this. And, and he literally just goes over each drawing with his, with his pencil. And, he, and his, his narration is, see, 
like this. Yeah, you know what I mean? No, like this. And he's just maybe doing outside of Freddie's head, you know, and just like, like this. And so he did that with every drawing. We were there for eight hours, standing over him, leaning over and going, uh-huh, oh yeah, that's great, okay. I think it's lunchtime. Um, and so he, he really wanted us to know that when it comes to Scooby, he, he designs the show. He designs those characters. So uh, anyway, I, I don't know if any lines really got changed that day because we're cranking this stuff out. I mean, you're not gonna spend eight hours on uh, 17 drawings, but you will, what a character. Uh, but let's see. So let's talk about a pup named Scooby Doo. What what can we? How how do we approach this? I mean, there was at the time. Was it kind of like a timepiece? I mean, the there was recently been a series called Flintstones. Uh, was it Flintstones Kids, yeah. where they kind of aged them down there as well? So was that kind of just a kind of a trend at the time, or was it kind of a coincidence that the two happened so close together? Yeah, it's a good point. I didn't like that show. The, the fun stunk kid, yeah. Um, you know, I, I feel like our, ours was almost a, a parody or a satire of Scooby because we 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 took all the the the, the basic key phrases, the the catchphrases, and we we sort of made fun of them. And uh, originally, we had Velma just saying "jinkies." That was it. That was the only thing she would ever say. And the story editors uh, complained. They thought it was too limiting. And I said, that's right, limit, limit, pull back. Just say jinkies. Because then all the, oh, Velma said jinkies. That must mean this, that, and the other thing. And she would go, she would nod. And uh, she would solve the crime, but never speak <laughs> at all. I thought that would be great. But, uh, you know, sometimes my vision is not followed. Uh, but uh, John Debney did the music and uh, I, he was hired to do the music. And I said, well, uh, here's what I want to do with the music. He's like, wait, that's not music, that's singing. So I said, that's right. And uh, so he hired uh, these great, great singers to uh, provide the acapella background music. And the, the, the sound editors hated me for that because we'd have dialogue going, you know, uh, Gee, school, where are we going? You know, oh, we have to go over here. And there'd be dialogue and Daphne and, and behind it would be and he said, we can't put singing voices behind. Of course you can, of course you can. And they did, and it worked out. Um, the main title that you mentioned that, uh, Scott Geralds and I worked, like it seems like forever. Once you got the first few episodes um, uh, boarded and timed and shipped and sent, then you realize, well, we do need a main title. And so we had the music, uh, Debbie and I worked on the music, I wrote the lyrics and, and so we had the music, but we needed the main title, the visual. So Scott and I uh, <laughs> worked on this thing. And it was very, very, very complicated. And you had to work backwards. And it, you basically, you were working with the final image, which was Scooby, like eating ice cream. And then the, the logo would lower down on So you had to work backwards because what we wanted the, the main title to be is one endless tracking shot from, from the very beginning, uh, dooby dooby, you know, from the logo and you go into the logo, into the letter, and then you see Shaggy's house and then you're going in the front door of the house and then you're going out the back door and you're in a graveyard. So we had it as one shot that had no, uh, no cuts. And we were doing it on Hannah Rivera's in-house computer system, which had that sort of 3D quality. There's a couple shots in it that have kind of a 3D quality. Yeah. Now we wanted the whole thing to have the 3D quality and we, we we did everything we needed to do to make it happen. And uh, the, the computer department, uh, they loved it. And uh, 
they said uh, Bill Hanna came in. So what? So how how long will this take to make the kid render it? And they said, oh, it'll it'll suck up uh, like a week of the, uh, the the money and time on this computer just to render that once. And that's if and there be mistakes left, they'd probably do it again. And he, he said, that's not happening. <laughs> that's not happening. So we cheated it, and uh, you know. It's, it's a fun main title, but it, it doesn't have the, the 3D quality. The 3D quality can be seen though. There's a DVD out that has a black and white rough cut uh, print of, of the, and that was the only copy of that that I, that I had and I lent them to, uh, to the video to, to use. So can I ask, in regards to, like you say, that was kind of the initial vision and everything, but did the kind of approach that you took change at all throughout the series? So, you know, starting on uh, a, like a bicycle built for Boo and kind of going on from there, did anything change when writing an episode or was you, were you quite, you know, consistent and decided on everything before you started? Well, I wrote uh, with, with Charlie and uh, Charlie Howell and Jim Ryan, a bicycle built for Boo. So that was my pilot, and you know that had all the attention and care that uh, that I'd like each episode to have. And I think Velma only says Jinkies in that, but I could be wrong. Um, uh, then, you know, we're making the show, and ABC insists that I not be the story editor. And I said, no, I kind of want to be the story editor. He says, No, you're the producer, and I I had not produced uh, a series for Hanna-Barbera yet. And so when I went to Warner Brothers later, you know, I was the producer, but I was also the head writer and the story editor. And really, it's, a, it's kind of a shame that I didn't get to follow through on the stories because some of the stories were a little uh, less than what I, what I wanted. I did want to have, I did enjoy having all the uh, little uh, Scooby, uh, music dance sequences, the Scooby romps. And uh, I insisted on those each episode. And so Debney, John Debney wrote those fun little tunes, totally totem pole guy. <laughs> totally <laughs> totem pole guy. Oh yeah, there's some good ones. <laughs> and then, um, and also, by the way, I wanna take credit for this. I, I named the town Coolsville. That's Ooh. where the, the town of Scooby-Doo came from, from a pup named Scooby-Doo. So it had, the town hadn't been named. Is that amazing? Until then. Wow, that is, that is incredible. That is incredible. Because Coolsville has gone on to become such an yeah. iconic location, like for the whole there'll of be a, There'll be a show called Coolsville someday, I'm sure. You know, nice. It's like uh, Riverdale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And now Daphne, uh, Kelly Martin did the voice. She, she won the role. She came in audition with her mom. She was a kid at the time. And, uh, and she was great, but there were a lot of girls that were great. And so, and then, so my little thing at the end of each audition, I would say, um, can you scream for us? Like you see something really scary. And she screamed and it, it made our hair, our hair like shot up. It was like really high pitched, just Fay Ray, King Kong, greatest scream on earth. And we all looked at each other and she's got the part. Oh yeah, she just adds such like, uh, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It almost makes her seem a bit posh and stuck up, but endearing at the same time. Like it's good to just see the whole gang go into like a haunted house and you, you know, and she's like, oh my gosh, this place is really grody and like just yeah, screaming just, whenever she steps in things. It's just an absolute Ew, my folks. Oh, <laughs> disgusting. Um, yeah. And then there's Red Herring, who's Freddie's foil. Uh, play, uh, Red Herring was played by Scott. Uh, Scott Menville, Scott Menville, who did uh, just did um, Teen Titans, and he, he did a, a sneezy on um, uh, Stubbin D for me. Scott Menville, just a kid, and, uh, and that was kind of a fun character to have a, a just a foil for Freddie. And Freddie, really, I mean, he's, he'd be a Trump Trumpster today, I'm sure, 
uh, he's into conspiracy theories and things like that. Oh yeah, and completely oblivious as well. Like he'll just say something completely like oblivious, and Daphne sarcastically goes, "Oh, you're a real businessman, Freddie." And he's like, "Yeah, I know." Even though he's just done something absolutely horrendous. I know. You wonder it's when crazy. did he get a little bit of self awareness? When did it happen that he he was a dunderhead? It must have happened, you know, when he was sixteen or something. But at this point, no. And and how does a kid that age wear an ascot? How does that? <laughs> What is that about? <laughs> it is just <laughs> such a great show. And do you have like reflecting on like back on the series now? Do you have a favorite episode that I guess really you were only involved in terms of the writing process of um, a bicycle built for Boo? But out of the whole series, do you have a favorite episode that stands out to you? Bicycle built for Boo, uh, the sludge monster from the Earth's core, the schnook who took my comic book, wanted cheddar alive. I like that one. The Babysitter from Beyond, I like. Uh, it's no place like home. Let's see, for better or worse. <laughs> Scooby Doo, is that the, which one's that, Scooby Doo? That's that the, like um, the surfer guy, like, hey man, it's radical. Is that, is that the skateboard one? Yeah. A ghost who's coming to dinner, the story stick, Robo Pup, lights, camera, monster. Yeah, I, I guess, uh, I do like Bicycle Built for Boo a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's it's definitely the, I mean, of course, with it being episode one, it's really the the episode that sets you up for the whole series and it absolutely does that. And it just gets everything right from the get-go. And I think this September coming is going to mark the 34th anniversary of the series. And to have a show that has remained so, I mean, you know, you've had multiple shows that have tested, like, have, have lasted the test of time. But in terms of a pup named Scooby-Doo, what's your kind of response that people still love the show, even, you know, after 34 years? Well, I think the first season of the show is holds up as well as uh, any of the cartoons made back then. You know, it, it, it used a lot of principles of animation that I had kind of learned from my mentors over the years. I mean, it had a lot of Tex Avery influence and that it, it was the first time we, we took Scooby and the gang and, and sort of made their eyes bulge and freak out. Uh, but we kept a lot of the best things of Scooby, like the romps, the, the musical romps and uh, the catchphrases. and um, you know, Freddie being sort of the leader, but being in this case, uh, a comic doofus of a leader. Uh, and Shaggy and Scooby always carry it. And the, the, the basic relationship, their basic relationship is the core of the show, the, the kind of love that those two have. And uh, I, I thought it was fun that we, we were able to look at the early days. And I, I, I think, it's really a part of the uh, entire Scooby universe now. I mean, they they uh, they had a little segment of it in the last sort of CGI Scooby, uh, his early days. Um, yeah, uh, the first villain in the show, uh, in in uh, Bicycle Built for Boo, was a fellow named Chuck McCann, and uh, Chuck McCann. And I, I was involved in the casting. I said, get, let's get Chuck McCann. Uh, when I was a child, uh, he had a show called Let's Have Fun. It's on every Sunday, Sunday morning. It was for around three hours. It was alive. And he would, and he's one of the funniest men on earth. He would come out and read the funnies, uh, the Sunday funnies from the Daily News, dressed up as a character. He would come out as Dondi and he'd be like on his knees with a little Dondi. And, and he was just so pathetic. And he'd come out as little orphan Annie. He was a big, he was like six two, big, large, not, not thin. And he got dressed up in a big red dress, like little orphan Annie. And he put white discs in front of his eyes. So, and a big red wig. And he couldn't really see where he was going. And uh, he would do Dragon Lady from Terry and the Pirates. He would do Dick Tracy, come in as Dick Tracy. Dick Tracy, he's got a bulldog jaw. And uh, so Chuck, Chuck McCann um, 
just so funny. So I, I've, I always wanted to use him uh, and got a chance to do it on Scooby. And he also played uh, uh, sort of our Siskel Ebert characters in, uh, in Animaniacs. I mean, it's been such a privilege to be able to speak with you and hear all these incredible stories that you have from working on Scooby. And can I ask, is there a memory that stands out to you the most as a favorite from working on Scooby? Um, let's see. Well, there, I, I don't know, this isn't my favorite, but I, I did want to mention this, it occurred to me before. So uh, when Pup Named Scooby came out, at the same time, uh, Mighty Mouse was uh, on. And uh, Mighty Mouse in some segment had s sniffed a bunch of white powder, <laughs> and, like off a flower, but, and he went, I think he went like that <laughs> to it. And, uh, oh, uh, fam, uh, parents, women's groups, uh, TV watchers, I mean, just uh, all sorts of uh, interest groups just freaked out. And, uh, and things had settled down now for a while. So before Scooby came on, uh, just as it was coming on, they interview you. And so this one interview I gave, they they asked you know what's the tone i said well it's trying to be you know a little a little you know it's trying to be a little bit edgy now and then um i mean we're not going to have uh scooby snorting cocaine like mighty mouse but uh we're, we're going to try to keep it fun and up and uh edgy um so i get this call and occasionally i'll get a call from someone else, and people do practical jokes so I got a call and I, yeah, is this Tom Ruger? And I, I said, yes, it is. You son of a bitch, how dare you say Mighty Mouse smoked there? He, he, he didn't sniff that coke, that was bullshit. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, um, I said, wait, wait, who is this? This is Ralph Batchy, you son of a bitch. I'm gonna get, oh, you, you're in trouble. And, and I said, all right, really, who is this? Who is this? I thought uh, Gordon Bressack would do a joke like this. Um, it was indeed Ralph Bakshi and <laughs> Tom Metton, one of my <laughs> writer friends, and Eddie Fitzgerald, and uh, a bunch of guys went in and they said, Hey, here's Ruger's number. Yell, go call him and yell at him. And they, so they were in the room watching Bakshi kind of rip, rip into me, and they were just laughing like mad. Uh, so that was one little experience that I had. But I did have another call uh, completely off the point uh, when I was at Warner Brothers where a guy called me, hello. Uh, I said, yes, yes. This is Clint Eastwood. I don't do a very good Clint Eastwood, forgive me. And I said, yeah. I said, yeah, sure it is. Okay, right. Tell me, what do you want, Clint? Well, uh, I got a kid over here. And I, I'd like you to, you know, see if maybe he could do some work for you. Well, I'll tell you what, Clint, um, why, don't you, uh, yeah, why don't you tell the kid to go jump in the lake, all right? Because I, cause I, I thought it was Gordon Bressack or Mitten or somebody. And just, no, really, this is Clint Eastwood. <laughs> And it, it really was Clint Eastwood. I, I said, I'll tell her, give me your number, I'll call you back. So I called him back and it was Clint Eastwood. Anyway, so I, I didn't tell the kid to jump in the lake. I, I mean, that's I kind of good that it all kind of ended happily. And again, like yeah. just to me thinking about the context of the show with the kind of controversy about the Mighty Mouse snorting, I'm almost kind of wondering now in hindsight if that in, like, you know, almost influenced the anti-drug episode of a pup named Scooby-Doo, be it, you know, socially or otherwise. That's kind of interesting. Well, yeah, we, we were very careful on, uh, I mean, we had broadcast standards. Uh, they didn't want us to do a lot of things. You always had that seatbelt on. I mean, they, they, you know, the skateboard guy, they, they, they had a problem with that. Oh, yes, I have a helmet on every second. Uh, you know, bicycles, you got to wear a helmet. Um, uh, you almost have a seatbelt on the bicycle, ridiculous. Uh, so they, they, we, we were very socially conscious, very careful. Um, you know, I think if you made Scooby brand new today, uh, and I, I think they probably should figure this out. I mean, you know, it was all white kids. And 
no way that that's how you would make that today. You just wouldn't, I mean, it would go, you would get some diversity going on in there. Yeah. Which it's is great. I actually mentioned that when we interviewed Bob Singer um, a couple of months back. Yeah, it's interesting, interesting point. Yeah, I remember when we made Hysteria, we had uh, Father Time was, he, he was supposed to be black, but somehow, I mean, he, he is not always black. He's sometimes he's brown, sometimes he's lighter brown. It's just we're uh, big fat baby uh, is supposed to be black, and it, 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 it's weird how things go through weird evolutions, and um, that's a shame. Uh, and I guess that's probably the last question I have. I know Rihanna and JB, you probably have a couple of others as well. But um, in our interview we did with James Tim Walker, he was saying how based on Ooh. practicality really uh one of the animators at warner brothers uh, um doing work in hannah barbera and scooby what's his uh, name uh it was james tim oh walker. james walker You're, yeah tim, tim walker oh i love him he's great yeah he, oh, was, yeah. Saying he was he used to dumpster dive for yeah. ourselves yeah but yeah. what i was gonna ask you about he said for like practicality reasons um hannah barbera used to have to get rid of so many of their cells and he used to try and, you know, try and retrieve some of them. Was there anything that you ever, you know, I, we've seen some of the incredible drawings that you've got, but is there anything else that stands out to you as something you managed to save from your time working uh, with Hanna-Barbera? Yeah, I wish I could pull it out. I have, um, uh, I bought this, but um, I bought it for like 50 bucks. It's a, it's a, it's a cell from the main tile of the Jetsons of, Leroy coming up in the camera in his little pod and he's like waving at it. It's a perfect cell. So I got Bill and Joe to sign that. Um, but it really is from the main title and you know, the paint's still perfect. Uh, I've got uh, several things signed by uh, Bill and Joe. I could, I could take you on a tour, but I, I got the, uh, the weird video going. Um, but I have a bunch of uh, cells. I have, yeah, I have lots of things from Hanna-Barbera uh and the scooby era for sure in unfortunately in recent news um one of the projects that warner brothers have cancelled is scoob holiday haunt and it was cancelled with basically 95 percent completion it was 10 weeks before it was like fully completed and we know that you worked with paul dinney and so that, that of course scooby-doo holiday haunt is one of his projects so has such a sudden cancellation ever happened before that you've been aware aware of because it came as a shock to all of us yeah and it's a shame it's a 40 million dollar project mm, yeah. 40 million dollars and i just read today that uh as long as a company doesn't monetize it in other words if they released it even to hbo or anywhere that would be in effect monetizing it but if they don't send it out to to make money they can write it off completely. So basically the new regime from discovery is, is just, they wanna get $40 million tax write off. Uh, so, uh, you know, it seems short-sighted. Uh, you know, Scooby has such a, a, a long shelf life. I mean, these things uh, have great value forever apparently. So uh, I don't know why they're doing it to that. I understand the Batgirl movie that they're they're also shelving and getting their tax write off as a ninety million dollar project, oh, yeah. and uh, so uh, I don't think the the new regime really understands the process of uh, a production line that you've got to got to keep filling it. Uh, uh, so yeah, I talked to Paul about uh, the Scooby thing, and it really is. Uh, it's Coolsville. It's it's taking place in uh, the 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 realm of a pup named Scooby Doo, which I which I'm I'm delighted that uh, that's the case, and uh, I'd love to see it. I think we all would like when when it was announced and we were told that it was them as kids. It was like this is a modern pup named Scooby Doo, and we're all so excited. But hopefully, you know we. 
JB has started a petition. We've had hashtag save scoop holiday haunt trending. So hopefully we can save the movie or at least, you know, everyone works so hard on it and it's so close to completion that it, it yeah, doesn't I'll, seem I'll right. Tell you what, have, them, have them just make a print. Don't charge anybody so they don't monetize it and uh, let us see it. I, yeah, I'd love to see it. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a shame. It really is. And, you know, we want to thank you again for coming on and speaking to us. because We've learned so much about the whole process of your journey into animation and the industry and everything. But we've been talking a lot about the past. So let's move a little bit towards the future. And do you have any upcoming projects that you can share with us, please? Well, one project I'm doing that I could share with you, I, I, I want to and I will, um, is not animation. I'm, my, my father-in-law is named Bill Malley. And he was the art director on the movie The Exorcist, and he uh, he was nominated for Academy Award for that. And so I've interviewed him, and I'm I'm putting together a documentary about ma the making of The Exorcist from his point of view, which is uh, fascinating and filled with just funny, bizarre stories. So uh, I'm going to have that done, hopefully in the next few months, and. Uh, I'll share that with whoever wants to see it. Um, I, I, my next animation, which I, I got to get back to, and I can't wait. Uh, I have uh, it's it's the vultures. Uh, I, I don't know if I've titled it. Uh, I think I've called it uh, "Winging It," and the concept is I've got these four great voice actors: uh, John McCann, Deanna Oliver, Sherry Stoner, and Paul Rugg. And they got them together and they uh, improv like a, an entire half hour story about this vulture family uh, moving to Thousand Oaks, California, looking for the better life. And, but they, they live up on the telephone poles and, and in the trees and they're, they're just looking for a carcass to eat. But, uh, <laughs> but they've done upscale there in Thousand Oaks. They used to be in 29, 29 Palms, but that's an artillery range and they didn't like that. They were getting blown up. Um, so anyway, uh, John, Paul, Deanna and Sherry uh, recorded just hilarious tracks for this. So, uh, so that's probably my next animated uh, release. Ooh. And Deanie and I have done a, an animated uh, piece that we still don't know what we're doing with. So yeah. Oh, well, we just can't Ooh. wait to that's, see all of that. That's all called Amazing. That's called that's called Bernice and Carl uh, Bernice and Carlisle saved the world, and uh, it's sort of like the nicer side of Pinky and the Brain because Pinky and the Brain want to take over the world, but in each episode Bernice and Carlisle have to save the world. Oh, that sounds like such an amazing time! And where can people watching this keep up to date with all of those projects? Say that again. Where can people watching this keep up to date with your projects and you know your oh, work in general? Um, let's see, that's a good question. Well, there's uh, my blog. I haven't been doing my blog much, cart cartoonatics uh, blogs, but um, where else? Uh, I do tw a little Twitter. I do a lot of Facebook. Uh, if you want to message messenger me on Facebook and say, hey, I listen to the. The, the show and I want to be a Facebook friend I'll I'll, I'll put you through <laughs> well, that's absolutely incredible and I guess that wraps us up for today just once again just to reiterate thank you so much for your time today you've been incredibly generous with it and thank you for sharing everything that you have done it's been an absolute honor honor to speak with you today well thank you and it's been a, a treat uh, meeting all of you and uh, let's do it again sometime well, thank you so much. That would be such a fun time. And thank you so much to everyone watching this today. It's incredible to see all the feedback that we've been getting recently. Please make sure to subscribe for more and follow all of Rihanna's social links in the description as well. So, yeah, this has been another episode on the JB and Millie channel, and we will see you next time.